Hello everyone. Welcome to Steel Force Welding and Forge. Today, my friends, I am super pumped because today I get to cross something off the bucket list. I finally purchased my very first metal lathe. Now, before we get started with opening this up and setting it up together, there's a couple people I want to thank. The most important person I want to thank is my grandfather. My grandfather was a machinist before the Second World War, and afterwards, he was no longer, unfortunately, to machine anything due to losing an arm. But he's the one that kind of first got me interested in the concept of machining. The next person I want to thank is Chris over at ClickSpring. I'll link his channel down below. Thank you, Chris, for inspiring me to want to pick up machining. The other person, and last, I want to thank Quinn over at Blondie Hacks. Quinn, thank you for such an awesome series of videos for the absolute beginner on how to learn to run a lathe. So thank you to all those people. And without further ado, let's start unboxing this bastard. So the lathe that I purchased is the Precision Matthews 1030V and the stand. This video is not sponsored. Let's go ahead and start opening this guy up. The lift gate service and it had this delivered into my garage. If you as well need to have that option, because this is quite a big and quite a heavy crate, just keep in mind that is expensive but worth it. Okay, looks like this is one side of the stand. There is one side. That is a nice looking little unit. Here's some hardware. Hmm, pretty nice. Looks like those are fixed shelves. So that's not going anywhere. That'll be nice for tool storage. My plan is to put some half inch um, concrete anchors into the ground and then level it using that. So as you can see here on the sides, you have easy access to those holes and those holes are half inch on the nose. So Look at that, very nice. Same mounting setup as the other side. Nice sliding drawers and another cabinet. For those who may not be familiar with banding like this, never stand over it, never stand behind it. In case it's super tight. Always give yourself a lot of room. Okay, so the chip tray was attached to the bottom of that. That's what those bolts are for. Oh man, look at that thing. So everything looks like it's in pristine condition. I ordered a few extras. For example, I ordered this whey lubricant. Whey oil is surprisingly difficult to come by unless you buy in bulk, I mean bulk. Gearbox oil. And they give you a nice printout of directions here. There we go. Keyless grill chuck. Keyless drill chuck. Aha. So here's all of our gears. Chuck key. Oh, look at that. They actually give you a bottle for uh, oiling your, your uh, machine. I ordered one beforehand. I didn't know that uh, they would supply you with one. Pretty nice. Um, jaws for the chuck. There's my dead center. This is actually included Everything in this box, I believe, is included with the lathe. And there's quite a few other small things in here. Screwdrivers. We'll go through and lay all this stuff out later to look at it. It's in here. Ah, this is the base wheel plate. Ah, this is the 
holding rest. There we go. That holds from three points. This is a really nice thing to come with the lathe. This is a four jaw chuck. Quick change tool post and looks like these are all of the tool holders that come with it. So this must be my live center. Two cans here. This I'm guessing is paint because I see a blue and a white uh, dot on it. All right. So this thing is quite nasty. I don't really want to start playing with the carriage or anything on here until we clean everything up. If there is dust or debris on the ways, if I move the carriage over, there's a good chance I could scratch or damage the ways. Once you damage the ways on your lathe, you might as well throw it away. They are the most important part of your lathe. So that's it for the unboxing. Let's go ahead and start putting the stand together. Okay, so we're going to be using 271 Loctite. This is the high strength stuff. So I would like to make note that the stand that I received in the mail is not the same as the stand they have pictured on their website. Now, while I would prefer to have the stand that's pictured on the website, I gotta say, I do like this one much more than the other. I gotta say, getting these to line up is tough. Okay, so now that I'm going to put the chip tray on here, that should give us a good estimate of where this is going to sit. Now, we want some room on this end for the tailstock. I want to make sure we have enough room to adjust it if we have a really long piece. However, on this side, as you can see, is where my welding station is. So we want to keep that as far away from that station as well. So it's kind of a give and take situation. Let's go ahead and get this lined up. So there's our chip tray. Now we have quite a bit of fudge room with this as well. Right about there is it centered. So we can still go back quite a bit. Now we don't want to be right up against the wall, but we do want room. So we want to be as close as we can get. We also want to make sure that we don't crack that concrete when we drill holes for our anchor. So we don't want to be right up to the edge. Okay, that looks pretty good. Let's go over here and take a look at the lathe for a second. All right, so I brought you guys in close here so you can see what I'm talking about. So if we unlock the tailstock and we move it back to the end of the ways, overall, this unit is 51 inches, and that is roughly from the gearbox to the lag screw which is the same size as the chip tray. So rough, the chip tray stops roughly right about here. So if we look here, that with the crank on it extends out about four and a half inches. So we'll call that five. You know, you want room in here for your hand. So you know what, let's call that six inches. We want at least six inches from that chip tray to the edge of the wall. So let's go back over to the lathe and make sure that's lined up properly. All right, so let's look at our chip tray here. Where it sits now, we have eight and a half inches to the wall, which is great. If we have a really long part, and I'm over here using this crank, I'm not gonna be hitting the wall. If we look over here, we've got enough room between the welder uh, tray and here, so I won't have to worry about banging into this, trying to put my welding cart back to where it belongs. Now, we do have some fudge with this chip tray as well. We can move it all the way over in this direction. And we are at nine and a quarter inches. Or if we move it all the way this way, the opposite direction, we are at eight inches. Let's go ahead, split the difference here. So we have two inch overhang on that side. 2-inch overhang on that side. So right now this is centered where it is. And we are at 8 inches. Let's go ahead and bring this my way a little bit. 8.5. So right there is pretty gosh darn good. Let's double check our tray. Make sure everything is centered. 8 and 5 eighths. Good enough. Okay. So... We have our distance this way. 
spot on. Let's take this chip tray off. Now let's make sure that our distance to the wall is the same. So right now we're at the two inch mark, Pull it over, two inch mark there, two inch mark there. Let's make sure we're still square. 46 and 3 eighths, 46 and 5 sixteenths. I'm okay with a 32nd out of square. So now we're gonna take a Sharpie and we're gonna trace out the holes underneath the cabinet and get ready to start drilling concrete. So I'm just taking a Sharpie, tracing the holes out. Now it's, <laughs> I gotta say, I'm not a big fan of this because it's really hard to get the Sharpie in here because I can't go straight down to mark the holes out. So my holes are not gonna be perfectly centered. I'm gonna have to try and take that into consideration. But I know that the inside edge of the hole will be right against the hole. So I can find something that's half an inch round. I can sort of get my holes closer to what they need to be by using that half inch piece of round material and trace it out that way. Okay, so here's our plan. We got all of our spots marked out. Now I went through with a half inch bolt and marked out the line, so that way my center is true to my circle. Now I was thinking about it while I was at the hardware store and trying to drill six spots with a concrete drill to put through a half inch hole and half inch bolts, um, you know, there's no room for error there. So instead, I opted for 3 8 bolts. This will give me a little bit of wiggle room in case I make a mistake while drilling my holes. So now, this particular brand, they tell me to drill down a quarter inch past the embedment of the bolts. So we're going to be drilling down to a depth of 2 inches. Now, there is one small problem, though. In order to correctly set these, you're supposed to put these onto your part, strike the top with a hammer with that embankment below it. I'm not sure that's going to happen. So what I think I'm going to do, drill them, put them in, and then tap them with a hammer, take the bolt and nuts off, put the desk back, or put the lathe table back on top of the bolts, then tighten everything down. Hopefully that's what's going to work. So let's go ahead and get to it. So for this, I'm going to be using my brand new power power drill hammer and we want to make sure that we are using both safety glasses and ear protection it's going to get loud in here all right so there's the holes now got to sweep up Blow the holes out and sweep it again. Okay, I know it's getting a little bit dark, but we got to work the light we got. So now I have this washer and nut set at one and three quarters. That'll give me that quarter inch gap they asked for. I'm going to set them in the holes, tap them. Hopefully that sets them and then I can take the bolts and washers off put the cabinet down, put the space underneath it and tighten everything down. I've got to make this quick. Phone's almost out of juice. We got all our holes drilled. Let's see if everything fits. <sighs> Full disclaimer, I forgot two holes. Had to go back and drill them while the camera was off. <sighs> We just gotta tweak her a hair. It's just barely off. There's that one. There's that one. So that side wants to go in. Okay, so here's what I did. I have a series of different shims ranging from a piece of banding that comes with the actual lathe. Pieces that are an eighth of an inch thick all the way up to a quarter inch. And with the way my garage floor slopes, I ended up having to put 
a quarter inch and an eighth inch piece on the corner of this side. Over here, all I have is a piece of one sixteenth inch. This gets this unit almost perfectly level. All right, so now we've got the cabinet leveled in this direction. Now we need to level it in this direction. So what we'll do, because the level is pointing this way, is we're going to put some shims under this side. We should be able to put the same size shim in that corner and that corner, and then maybe we'll have to put something on these and maybe some small shims here. And then we should have this thing pretty level. So this is the banding that came wrapped uh, around the pallet that the lathe was on. This stuff, they make very good shims. These are about a 32nd of an inch thick, slightly more. So if you have to adjust your level just slightly, these are great. That doesn't quite do it. All right. We'll go ahead and tighten everything down. Double check our level. All right, so we have our stand leveled in both directions. Now it's time to go ahead and put the lathe on top. Now I do want to point out one thing. No matter how fickle and careful you are with leveling this thing out, you are going to have to fine tune your lathe even further using a machinist's level. So get it as close to level as you can. If you can't quite get it perfect, that's okay. Move on and we'll adjust it later on. This crane I'm using is a foldable crane from Harbor Freight. I also have an unboxing and assembly video for it. Check out the link below. As you can see, I'm struggling quite a bit to get this thing off the pallet. Unfortunately, with this style of foldable crane, the center of the picking point is pretty far behind the legs, so it's making picking this up really difficult. So I'm just taking my time, picking it up bit by bit, adjusting it here and there, really going really slow. This point is crucial. If I make a mis whoops, if I make a mistake here and bang this machine up, I could be setting myself back several thousands of dollars. Don't want to do that. Now hindsight is 2020. In retrospect, what I could have done is use the crane to pick up the pallet on both sides and then put some wood underneath it and then been able to slip the legs of the crane underneath the lathe and pallets and picking it up would have been a lot easier. Here I'm putting this pallet back on the legs of the crane so I can set this down and readjust the strap so that I pick the lathe up square. A big thank you to my wonderful wife who you'll see here in a second. Without her there is absolutely no way I would have gotten this lathe set up without damaging it. See, the problem is once I lift it up past this point, it starts to move back. I think with doubling that up, I can get it now. I'm going to push on it so that it's over where it needs to be. And then you are going to turn that gently so that it falls very slowly. There you go. All right, honey, go ahead, slowly bring her down. Oh, wait, okay, now. There you go, perfect. Oh. No, I'll let it down more. There you go, that's good. Oh my God. So if you guys want to see a perfect example of what kind of luck I sometimes have, look at the gap there. Now this is something I honestly did not account for, but thankfully it worked out. Make sure you guys will make the same mistakes. Looks like that is about five inches from my wall. So adjust your stand accordingly.
Now I'm going through and installing all the handles on the adjusting knobs. The next step is going to be leveling the ways of the lathe using a machinist level. I'll include a link for the machinist level below. So let's talk about how to properly check the level on your lathe. Now, unfortunately, when I first started doing this, I made an error. Instead of placing the level on these blocks and on these flat parts of the waves, I was placing my level straight on the top of these trapezoid shaped parts of the waves. This is incorrect because they are not the correct height. The proper way to do this is to wipe down your ways, wipe down a pair of one, two, three blocks on your top and bottom surfaces. This is to ensure there isn't any debris underneath them. Wipe down the bottom of your level, place your level on your one, two, three blocks. I'll bring you guys in for a closer look, but right now I'm currently one line above the parallel lines. Now these are extremely precise levels. So the amount that this is out of level is almost negligible. So what we do now, we do the same thing over on this side. Wipe, wipe, place that down. Wipe, wipe, place that down. And we place our level on top of those two spots as well. And again, I'll bring you guys in for a closer look in a minute. But right now, we're on that exact same line here as we were down here. So as this thing sits, it is almost perfectly level. Now, you can go through and take a feeler gauge, disassemble it, and use those shims to further shim your, your lathe. I believe you can put it under here as well on both sides, and that is the way to fine tune this, get this perfectly level. But I think for now, we're going to leave it. So here we are on the right side. You can see where that level is sitting, that bubble. So here we are on the left side of the ways, and that bubble is in the exact same spot. So as it sits right now, there is no twist at all in these ways. So while we're not perfectly level, I think we're gonna be okay. Now, while we're level on this plane, you may be wondering about being level on this plane. And from what I understand, you want to be close, but it is nowhere near as critical as being level and out of twist on this plane. To check it going this direction, we wipe off our cross slide, again, wipe off our level, and we place that on top of our cross slide. And if we were to look in here, our bubble is quite past the level line. And if I tip it up, I mean, we're out of level, not even a 64th of an inch. I'm not sure what to call that. So I could go through and try to level it in this direction, but I'm probably going to adjust my level going this way. And without using any extremely slim pieces of shims, it is a miracle that I've got it as level as it is. So I am not going to touch it. If down the road I find out that this is going to cause me problems, then I will adjust it. But for now, we're going to leave it as is. Okay, so we're just about ready to get this thing running. A few more things we got to do to make sure this is ready to go. And that would be oiling it and checking our levels. So if we check down here, we have a glass window to check our gearbox fluid level. So I look down here and it is fine. We're good to go there. The next place to check for a Oil level is down here on our carriage. There's a small window down here. We'll check down here. We're good to go down there. So our carriage level and our gearbox levels are full. Now we want to go through and oil these little spots here. These are, are called oilers. What you will do, you'll take your whey oil and an oiling can similar to this. You actually push it down on these balls and these balls will depress and you just pull the level or pull the lever and a little bit of oil will come out. And that is how you oil these oilers. It does not take much. You can refer to your instructions and it will tell you exactly where they are and what to do to oil and service your lathe. So let's go ahead and do that. And you know what? I think we'll go ahead and use the can that is actually provided by Precision Matthews. Let's see how well that thing works. 
Okay, now one thing I've forgotten to mention about Oilers, there are two different kinds. There's the kind with the sort of flat tip and the kind with the sharp tip. The sharp tip is for oiling these oilers like this. Now this, again, is a can provided by Precision Matthews, so we'll go ahead and use this. We're just going to go through the instructions here, and we're going to go through and oil all of these spots, and I'll work through them with you. All right, so that comes up. There's one way down in this dovetail groove. Let's try and wipe it off. We don't want to force any of the crud that's on top of that thing inside that spot. <sighs> These typically do not take much oil at all. Looks like this guy's leaking a little bit. Not the end of the world. It is a free oiler. Same spot. Gave that about half a pump. There. Hmm. This thing's leaking quite a bit now. I think we'll go ahead and try giving this a Tighten that up a bit. All right, just tighten here with a wrench just a little bit. Much better. Aha, right here on the back of the compound slide. I got this guy right up here, here. Then there's one down here for the lag screw. Okay, that is it for the oilers. So, looks like the next step is going to be to go through and just kind of wipe this machine down in general. Nothing too fancy. For that, I'll probably be using WD-40. Well, I'll just be going in on these kind of tight to reach spots, make sure there's no debris or dust or anything on that, like that. Then we'll go through the parts that came with the machine into some more detail. We'll look at the gearbox. And then it's going to be time to fire this guy up. Okay, the lathe is almost ready to go. So before we fire it up, let's go through and I'm going to show you what was and was not included with the kit that came from Precision Matthews. This wrench was included, what it's called, I don't know. A follow steady rest, steady rest. We have a boring tool holder. Two parting or facing tool holders. I mean, two facing or turning tool holders. I believe this is a neural cutting tool. And then a parting tool holder. We also have this guy, which I believe is just a generic, like old fashioned tool holder. This handle, which is for tightening this tool holder down. We have a small and large dead centers these are very nice to have included. Reverse holding, three jaw chuck holders, face plate. We have various uh, keys. Then we have Allen wrenches, these box wrenches. We also have a four jaw chuck, and this is by far probably the nicest accessory to have. A good four jaw chuck can set you back quite a bit in mind. The fact this was included in that kit is awesome. This oiler was included, as well as all of these gears for threading and different cutting speeds. This box came with it. And now as for what was not included, this keyless chuck with a wrench was not included. I bought this optionally, as well as this small live center. And one thing I almost forgot. These two fuses are included. These are for the fuses on the front of the unit. And we also have these two small collars. I'm not quite sure what these are for, if I had to guess, for the gearing. So there's all the parts that, in, that are included. Now it's time to go ahead, load up that cabinet, get all the tools put away, all the precision tools and all that fun stuff. And I think we're going to start setting up our tool holders, zero everything in, and get ready to do some cutting.
we're back. So I've got most of my drawers all lined and filled up. It looks a little unorganized right now, but I'll build dividers eventually to make that a little bit nicer. So we have all my precision tools, deburring tools, one, two, three blocks. In here, this cabinet is still empty. I haven't done anything to put it in yet. Up here, I have my four-way chuck tool post, drill bit, my dead centers and live center. Down here, faceplate oilers, and my follow and steady rests. So one of the main reasons why I chose this lathe over some of the other models is this not only has power feed with the saddle, this has power feed with the cross feed as well. That's kind of a rare feature. So right now we have this engaged in the forward position at the A speed. We're going to go ahead and turn this on and we're going to play with the power feed speed a little bit and see how that plays out. So I believe in and up is the power cross feed. Hmm, doesn't seem to be locking in. What's going on here now? Also, if we engage the half nut, that seems to work no problem. Half nut's neutral position. There we go. Looks like this has to be up all the way. So now our, you can see our power cross speed is slowly moving in. We can probably increase our speed and that'll go faster. There we go, there's that. So pull down, disengages. Pull out and pull up, shooting uh, trigger the saddle power feed. And there we go. So both those features work very nice. And finally, half nut, engage. Now this uses the threading on the lag screw, whereas the power feed utilizes the key way. Very nice. All right, everything seems to be working really well. There is one more thing that we need to zero out and we'll be ready to start making chips. The next step in setting up our lathe is to make sure our centers are aligned. So first we're going to go ahead and remove our three jaw chuck. Always be sure to put down something on your ways to prevent them from being damaged in case the chuck falls onto the ways. So in order to remove the three jaw chuck, we're going to stabilize it using a crescent wrench and using the provided wrench, we're going to loosen, but not remove the three hex nuts that are right behind the knurled black shutter ring. The shutter ring is that black ring that you can see directly to the left of that last silver part of the three jaw chuck. Once the hex nuts are loose, we're going to go ahead and turn the knurled black shutter ring counterclockwise and the three jaw chuck will just slip right off. I've already installed the dead center. To install this all you simply do is put it into the hole and ram it home. Now we're going to move our saddle as far to the left as we can and bring up our tail stock. And into our tail stock we're going to go ahead and install our other dead center. Now this method for aligning our centers can only be used if you have two brand new dead centers. So we're going to go ahead and crank that forward, ram it home, and now that dead center is installed as well. So now we're going to take a razor blade and we're going to crank the dead center forward until it makes contact with the other dead center. And as you can see, that razor blade is sort of tweaked to one side. And we also want to lock this in to make sure that that's not a cause for the razor blade. But if our razor blade isn't sitting square, that tells us that our tail stock is off. So we're going to go ahead and have to adjust that. The orientation of the razor blade indicates the tail stock needs to move towards me to be centered. So in order to move the tail stock, you need to loosen the offset screws on the side you want the tail stock to move towards and to tighten it on the opposite side. Now after a little bit of fiddling around because I went too far the first time, I eventually got that razor blade to sit perfectly square.
This is a very crude method of centering your tailstock to your center. There's a much more precise way to do it, and I'll be doing that at a later date. So now that the tailstock is dialed in, this lathe is now ready to go and to start making chips. However, this video got a lot longer than I was anticipating, so we're going to go ahead and stop it now. So keep an eye out for part two, where we're going to attempt to make a highly precise part using some of the various techniques used on a lathe, like center drilling, facing, turning to a shoulder, parting, all that good stuff. And thank you everyone for your subscriptions. We just passed the 2,000 subscription mark, which is amazing. So thank you very much for that. And as promised, all funds received from this YouTube channel will be directly reinvested back into the channel to purchase better camera making and video making equipment. So again, thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping this channel grow. So that does it for today's video, folks. Please like, please subscribe, please share this video, and work hard and stay humble.